Hey everyone, this lesson is on the medications chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what these medications are. We're also going to talk about what we use these medications for. We're also going to discuss the mechanism of action of these medications, and we're also going to talk about some of the adverse effects of using these medications. So chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, here are the chemical structures. So the only difference between chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is this hydroxyl group here. Hydroxychloroquine is also known as plaquenil. That's the trade name. So these are both four aminoquinolone derivatives, and they are anti-malarial or anti-protozoal medications, but there's some evidence that they are also antiviral. We're going to talk about these in more detail later on. They also have immunomodulatory effects and can be used to treat rheumatological conditions as well. These medications are only administered orally. You never want to use them IV because they have increased toxicity with IV use. And they both penetrate well into tissues and have wide distribution. Now, after ingestion of these medications, these are both primarily metabolized in the liver, so they have hepatic metabolism. And the main metabolite of the metabolism of these medications is desethylchloroquine. They are mainly excreted in the urine, about 70% of it is excreted that way. And they have a half-life of about three to five days and because of these medications' wide distribution in the body and their moderate half-life, they can last in the body for weeks to months. The main microbial targets of their use is protozoa. These include plasmodium species. Plasmodium species are protozoa that cause malaria. So these are commonly referred to as anti-malarial medications. So plasmodium species like plasmodium ovale and plasmodium malariae can both be targeted with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, especially in their blood stages of infection. Plasmodium vivax is also a species that can be targeted with these medications. But with regards to the other plasmodium species known as plasmodium falciparum, this plasmodium has widespread resistance to chloroquine, so we can't use chloroquine when treating this plasmodium. We'd have to use hydroxychloroquine or another medication. And chloroquine can also be used to treat entamoeba histolytica, an infection caused by an amoeba. With regards to virus targets of these medications, the one that is being talked about a lot nowadays is the SARS coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the disease known as COVID-19. There is some anecdotal and in vitro evidence to support these medications as a possible treatment for this virus or this condition. And there is some more research going on to see, can we use it to treat COVID-19 or can we use it for pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis? So pre-exposure prophylaxis, essentially, before you get exposed, you can take this medication to help protect yourself from getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. Or post-exposure prophylaxis, you've been exposed to someone that has the virus. Can you take this medication to help protect yourself from actually getting infected with it in the first place? So... There is still a lot of research going on to see does hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine treat or prevent SARS-CoV-2 infections. This has all been started by the study here. Essentially, it's just in vitro data supporting the use of these medications. So right now, we're waiting on further trial to see if they are effective. So what is the mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in a protozoa like plasmodium. So plasmodium, like other protozoa, have a food vacuole. It's something they use to digest their nutrients. These food vacuoles have a proton pump that brings in hydrogen ions, so acidifies the food vacuole. Now chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are both alkaline. So when chloroquine enters into the protozoa and enters into the food vacuole, it can actually alkalinize the food vacuole. It can also inhibit proton pump function as well. So it all increases the pH of the food vacuole, preventing that food vacuole from digesting the nutrients required for the protozoa. So this is how chloroquine can be used to treat protozoal infections. It essentially starves the protozoa by increasing the pH of the food vacuole, preventing that food vacuole from being able to digest nutrients properly. Now, the antiviral mechanism of action of both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine has not been entirely elucidated at present, but what is believed to happen is that the 
SARS-CoV-2 virus can enter into a target cell through endocytosis. So an endosome can be formed and that endosome can fuse to a lysosome in the cell, allowing the virus to enter the lysosome and then exit the lysosome and infect the cell. So in order for the lysosome to fuse properly to an endosome, it requires an acidified environment. That acidified environment is facilitated by a proton pump known as V ATPase. So vacuole ATPase is a hydrogen ion pump pumping in protons into the lysosome, acidifying the lysosome. Now, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine can inhibit this proton pump, preventing hydrogen ions from getting into the lysosome to acidify the lysosome. So when we have a lysosome with an increased pH, it's not as functional as it should be. It won't be able to fuse with an endosome like it should. So this is a possible mechanism to how chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine can treat viral infections like the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. Now, besides the protozoal and viral infections, we can use these medications to treat rheumatological conditions as well. Out of these two medications, hydroxychloroquine is used much more frequently than chloroquine for rheumatological conditions. And the rheumatological conditions we can treat include lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, dermatomyositis, primary Sjogren's syndrome, and porphyria cutanea tarda. So how does hydroxychloroquine treat these conditions? Hydroxychloroquine can alter immune cell function. It can actually alter multiple things that immune cells actually do. One of those is it inhibits movement of neutrophils. It can also inhibit eosinophil chemotaxis and inhibit complement-mediated actions. So hydroxychloroquine, through its ability to alter these immune cell functions, has immunomodulatory effects. It can help treat those perturbations that occur in autoimmune conditions like some of these we talked about here. So some considerations with regards to using chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine are contraindications. So these medications are contraindicated. That means that they are not used in a patient who has had previous hypersensitivity reactions to chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in the past. So hypersensitivity reactions are like allergic reactions. If they've had a bad allergic reaction to these medications in the past, we don't use them. Now, there are certain adverse effects of these medications. The most common ones are headaches and dizziness. We can also see abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea, and puritis or itching. And the puritis is often temporary and can resolve spontaneously. Now, there are a variety of other adverse effects of these medications that can affect multiple systems in the body. These are more rare, so they are reported but are very rare and don't happen often. The one that does happen more often are the skin changes, like a puritic maculopapular rash. So we talked about puritis before. This can be related to a maculopapular rash. We can also see hyperpigmentation. So areas of the body become hyperpigmented and darkened. We can also see hair loss. And a rare complication is Stevens-Johnson syndrome as well. And another system that can be affected by these medications that we already talked about is the gastrointestinal system. So we can see abdominal cramps, decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Cardiovascular complications include prolonged QT interval. This is a big one if we're going to use this medication, especially if we're going to use it with other medications because this one can also prolong QT interval. You can also see AV block, bundle branch blocks, cardiomyopathy, hypotension, ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and torsade to point that is related to the prolonged QT interval. With regards to endocrinological adverse effects, we can see hypoglycemia, so low blood sugar. This may also trigger or exasperate porphyria. With regards to hematologic adverse effects, we can see a reversible agranulocytosis. So basically your granulocytes are all gone or very depleted, but this can be reversible. Aplastic anemia can also occur. Hemolytic anemia, especially in individuals with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. And we can also see pancytopenia. There are also hepatic adverse effects, so transaminitis and hepatitis, so inflammation of the liver. Hypersensitivity can also occur, so you can get your typical allergic reaction. You can also see dress, so drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. There's also muscular adverse effects like proximal myopathy. There's a bunch of different neurologic adverse effects with chloroquine. So agitation, anxiety, confusion, 
deep tendon hyporeflexia, delirium, depression. There's many here, and I won't discuss all of them in detail. The eyes can also be affected by chloroquine. This is very important, especially with an individual who is being treated prolonged, like an individual with lupus. You want to have regular follow-up with an ophthalmologist. Make sure that they don't have development of macular degeneration or retinopathy. You can also see a reversible corneal opacity as well. And the ears can also be affected with chloroquine. You can have hearing loss or tinnitus, so a ringing of the ears from this medication. And this oftentimes occurs in patients with previous hearing issues in general. So a lot of listed adverse effects with regards to chloroquine. Again, a lot of these are rare, and a lot of medications do have a large list of adverse effects, but I just wanted to discuss them here. The especially important ones are the skin changes. These occur in a significant amount of patients, 10% of patients. And the big ones that you want to kind of take away from this are it prolongs QT interval and it can cause a reversible agranulocytosis, macular degeneration. So those are the big ones that you want to take away from this list here. So if you want to learn more about other drugs and medications, please check out my pharmacology playlist. And if you found this lesson helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn, and I hope to see you next time.